Okay, I guess we will get uh, started. Um, again, thank you very much for joining Merit Rounds. I guess it's virtual rounds now. Um, with the advent of these extraordinary times, we are seeking additional ways for us to engage and to continue to have conversations. But it's also a really interesting uh, social experiment as we have an opportunity to extend these conversations beyond kind of the geographical boundaries of uh, the McMaster community. Um, we're really particularly delighted today to have uh, Paula Rowland from the Wilson Center joining us. Uh, Paula is an education scientist at the Wilson Center whose work uh, spans the issues of patient engagement and patient safety. Paula will certainly have uh, some further things to say about her own program of research. For those of you who are new to the Merit community, welcome. We'd like you to feel involved and engaged. We are attempting to continue to build this community of clinicians and scientists who are advancing health professions education. This is one of a number of different initiatives that we have. And so look to us in, for other opportunities to connect and to be a part of the conversations that are happening around health professions education. Um, of specific note, I would direct you to the Norman Education Research Day, which will be happening the 3rd of June. Um, we will have an opportunity here from Nikki Woods, also from the Wilson Center present, and then to engage with the real phenomenal breadth of education scholarship from amongst our community in a virtual environment. Um, you can find more about that at the Merit website, which is merit.mcmaster.ca. Um, if you're interested in what's come before and you are um, really taken with some of the conversations that we have today, we have a whole YouTube channel of a uh, backlog of previous presentations which are quite diverse with a number of different conversations. And so again, we would direct you there. You can find out more about us um, at our Twitter handle, which is Merit underscore McMaster. So the process for day, we have slightly under an hour. I'm gonna give uh, Dr. Roland the floor to um, begin her presentation. Um, near the end, um, we will have an opportunity to facilitate questions and answers. Just some protocol and some etiquette if this is one of your first kind of virtual presentations, we'd ask you to keep your uh, microphone on mute. Certainly when you want to address the speaker or ask a question, you'd be invited to do that. In fact, if you open up the participants sidebar, then you can see a raise hand function and the moderator will be able to watch for that and be able to direct, your, direct you in and to kind of facilitate questions. Equally, you can type a question and again, uh, our moderator will uh, facilitate some of that for Dr. Rowland so she doesn't have to do all the work of coordinating mm -hmm. presentation, running her slides and then trying to figure out who's asking what. So, with further ado, I know you really want to hear from Dr. Roland and less from me. Thank you very much for joining us and welcome to Merit Rounds. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me and thank you for stepping in just now, Jonathan. And when Elijah was come into the house and there was a child that was dead, Elijah went in and he closed the door. First he prayed and when he went up and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands and he stretched himself upon the child and the child opened his eyes. And that might be the first recorded account of something that sounds like an attempt at resuscitation. This is where the history of CPR begins. In this history, there were resuscitation methods found to be effective in the field, even when there were no known physiological basis for them. And there were methods that were carefully researched in medical laboratories found to be ineffective in the field. This history is useful in helping us think about professional learning and continuing professional development. Through Elijah's prayer, the revival of this child was God's work. And in the early days of resuscitation, it was essential to make this kind of distinction between revival and resuscitation, between God's work and human intervention. Really, what we have here is an argument of scope of practice, writ biblical, a separation between God's work and the capacity of humans. And early practitioners had to work really hard to make this case. They had to build a convincing argument that there was a difference between clinical death and biological death. In a quote from Dr. William Hawes in 1774, he declares, reviving is merely to rekindle a flame of a taper by gently fanning the ignited wick. Resurrection is to reanimate a corpse after a vital spark is totally extinct. Dr. Hawes and others needed to make an awful lot of powerful people and institutions believe this argument. Without making this distinction, the practice of resuscitation would never have been allowed by the powerful church. And they were successful in making this case and the resuscitation movement took hold in the late 1700s. In Britain, the Royal Humane Society for the Apparently Dead was formed 
and it was formed from the earlier Society for the Recovery of Persons Apparently Drowned. So they were able to expand their scope even more. And they were able to create guidelines that were propagated through flyers and through word of mouth. Some early advice around resuscitation included warmth, artificial ventilation, administrating tobacco smoke rectally or fumigating it, rolling the body over a barrel, rubbing the body and bleeding from a vein, along with the accessory means of vomiting, sneezing, and administering internal stimulus. Now this conflicting advice persisted for a long time, even as researchers became involved. There are heated academic debates about whether the victim should be prone or supine, rolled or not rolled, whether arm movements should be involved or not. And after some 50 years of debate, eventually the field seemed to settle on one method, the Sylvester method. But as the research carried on, there were some disappointing findings. None of the previous methods, including the winning Sylvester method, actually moved freshly oxygenated air into the lungs. So on purely experimental grounds, it seemed that attempts at ventilation were hopeless. This is despite hundreds of years and thousands of people claiming to have had success in the field. And here's the disconnect. Everyone wants to save lives, but the researchers are telling the practitioners who are telling the researchers they're wrong. So this disconnect between research-based knowledge and practice-based knowledge is part of the history of CPR. So time went on and a new set of guidelines were developed. A two-page standard was published around the back pressure arm lift method. These guidelines are accompanied by training films and widespread publicity campaigns. These guidelines were taken up and adopted on a broad scale by a range of organizations the American National Red Cross, Armed Forces, the Boy Scouts of America, Girl Scouts, the YMCA, and so on. Now, of course, we have new guidelines. And what I really want to point out here is the massive network that was created through this large continuing education campaign. This network of associations, educators, and practitioners still exists, and they've become the path through which new guidelines can be disseminated. Further, this massive network means that practices could be standardized. No more local arguments about positioning, rolling or not rolling. Everyone was doing the same thing. And it was that standardization that made it far more possible to measure the impact of all of the CPR work. Of course, the history of CPR goes on. The introduction of external heart massage into the guidelines introduced a new scope of practice problem. Not with God this time, but with doctors that believed heart massage should be a protected act. And as more and more members of the public achieved CPR training, there was a new distinction to be made between those who had basic life-saving skills and those who had advanced life-saving skills. The debates between researchers and practitioners also continued. In an effort to reduce extraneous variables, researchers advocated for measuring survival rates only for persons with a witnessed cardiac arrest in ventricular fibrillation and who had cardiac etiology. So this move by the researchers excludes the nearly 200 year history of practice that was rooted in the society of the apparently dead, more or less turning them into the society of the nearly dead who happen to have a witness, no complicating factors and the best chance of surviving. Now, if you want to read more about the history of CPR, I'd recommend Stephen Timmerman's Sudden Death and the Myth of CPR, or Harry Collins and Trevor Pinch's Dr. Golem, How to Think About Medicine. What I'd like to highlight from this history is that continuing education is intimately tied to scopes of practice. In this history, the scope dilemmas are first between God and human intervention, but later include scope dilemmas with doctors or between those with basic and those with advanced life-saving skills. And this observation brings attention to the political aspects of continuing education. As one profession attempts to build its knowledge base, it will inevitably bump up against other professions or groups also laying claim to this space. Now, developing knowledge in this space is not just about having the best evidence. It also involves negotiating and navigating these knowledge spaces in their various debates. This history also highlights how continuing education can effectively spread guidelines, update skills, and standardize practice. And the scope and the scale of the CPR continuing education campaign speaks to these possibilities. And this kind of continuing education will always rely on principles of education science to inform the design, the delivery, and evaluation of curriculum. But just focusing on these continuing education interventions, how well they work, how well they're taken up, how they participate in changing practice, they wouldn't tell the complete story of how practices of CPR have evolved. Also apparent in the history of CPR are the contradictions between the knowledge that's developed in clinical practice and the knowledge that's developed in research settings. Now research may exclude much of clinical practice. There can't possibly be a research answer for every eventuality. Much of what we know we learn in practice settings, but that doesn't mean that practice-based knowledge can be or should be uncontested. An idea that's been in practice for a very long time isn't necessarily a good idea. So research and practice-based knowledge are situated differently 
and the work of the professional is to reconcile these contradictions and figure out how to go on as intelligently as possible. The particular interpretation of CPR exemplifies a sociocultural interpretation of learning. And this means that I highlighted how knowledge is produced, how knowledge is contested, what and how knowledge is considered legitimate, and how someone becomes a recognized practitioner. So rather than focusing exclusively on the cognitive processes of individuals, sociocultural understandings bring in a focus on the professions and the practices. And so while my understanding of learning includes contributions of continuing education programs, I'm also paying attention to a broader arena where learning involves engaging with research, learning with and from patients, conferring with colleagues, and reflecting on one's own practice. And it's all of these ideas that I'm pulling forward when I say professional learning. Recently, I had experienced them using game of delete and replace in one of my research papers. So I had continued to write professional learning in the draft. And a valued colleague who's gracious enough to give a pre-submission review of the manuscript kept crossing out the word professional. And after the fourth such deletion, she wrote in the margins, why do you keep writing professional learning? Isn't all learning just learning? Well, no. If you were to consider learning from a cognitive perspective and you're concerned with the individual acquisition, integration, and application of knowledge, then adding the descriptor professional to learning does seem out of place. The title of professional does not give any special jurisdiction over the processes of learning, it does not assume a different kind of cognitive process, it does not promise a different kind of result. Learning's learning, irrespective of where and how that learning is put to work. Context matters, of course, but the attention is still on individual brains. But if you were to consider learning from the sociocultural perspective, however, then the descriptor of professional learning signifies a different understanding of learning. Sociocultural draws our attention beyond individual brains to other concepts, concepts about knowledge, and that knowledge belongs to entire professions. This isn't an individual unit of analysis, it's a group level of analysis. Individual clinicians possess various aspects of knowledge in their respective fields, but the body of knowledge that defines a profession or a specialty is produced by groups. So to demonstrate professional learning is to become a member of this group, to figure out how to go on about one's work as a member of this profession. So this professional knowledge is not just what has been acquired through formal education, but also includes what the profession knows about how to get the work done. So this knowledge must also encompass the ways the professions are governed, how one profession interacts with other professions, how professionals interact with the organizations that employ them or give them appointments, how labor laws and other forms of legislation influence their work and by extension, what can be learned. These perspectives also encompass implications of shifting knowledge relationships with patients and publics. So to emphasize professional learning is to think about entire systems of professional production that include research generating bodies, regulatory bodies, employers, professional associations, and the expectations of patients and publics, and how all of these systems and processes relate to one another. So the signifier of professional learning draws attention to a different unit of analysis, what is possible to learn at all. And this leads to another related idea, the sociological understandings of professions. When we think about professions from a sociological perspective, we consider the roles they have in society, what they do, what the public trusts them to do, and this leads to a specific understanding of professions. Here, professions are considered those groups in society who claim specific knowledge, who use that knowledge on behalf of society, and as a result, are allowed to do things that are considered risky. So based on their claims to knowledge, health professions are allowed to put their hands in and on bodies, to inform policies, to define health and illness. And these are risky endeavors. And because of this work, health professionals are valued, but they're also governed. They're autonomous, but they're also accountable. Their role in society is tightly tied to what professions know. Their claim to knowledge and their associated commitment to use this knowledge for the greater good of society allows professions to continue to hold their particular role in society, including their privilege and prestige. So taking on this sociological understanding of professions leads to another related claim for the role of continuing professional learning. If the claims for professionalism are based on learning and expertise, then demonstrations of lifelong learning should be as a central, not marginal concern for education and education science. And yet, I don't see this emphasis on continuing education or continuing professional development in education and education scientists. I don't see the research funding, the dedicated conferences, the research chairs, the professional or academic career trajectories that would elevate continuing education and continuing professional development as a field of study and educational practice. Now, maybe this lack of prominence is the result of some problematic history in the field of continuing education, maybe particularly relationships with industry. 
Maybe this is based on some erroneous assumptions about how confidence is both achieved and sustained. Or maybe, as some have argued, the problems with the field of continuing education run quite deep, and they're based on implausible assumptions about how and why people learn. But whatever the reason for this lack of prominence in the education field, I want to make a strong case for understanding how professionals actually learn throughout their clinical careers and to understand how that professional learning can be best supported. And this is different than a focus on continuing education as an intervention. From a sociological perspective, continuing education is just one element in a broader system of professional learning. We have a need, even an obligation, to think about professional learning more broadly than just the formal efforts in continuing education interventions. So what could be the role of educators in supporting this enormously complex work of professional learning? I'll get a bit more concrete here and talk about some strategies. So most of these strategies are developed in research in fields outside of health professions education. And what they share is a grounding in how learning happens in work and through work. So rather than asking what kinds of cognitive processes and conceptual structures are involved, researchers in this field tend to ask, what, ask questions about the kinds of social engagements or physical settings are required to set the proper structures for knowing, working, learning, and innovating. And so from that understanding, they propose roles for educators in supporting professional learning. And they have an expansive view of what it means to be an educator. Sometimes that means being a teacher imparting knowledge. That might even look the way we have traditionally conceptualized continuing education interventions. But more often, these strategies talk about educators as coaches, as mentors, as facilitators, as interpreters, as catalysts for reflection, or as choreographers pulling together different threads of knowledge circulating in the workplace. Video reflexive ethnography is one intervention that displays all of these educational roles. Now in this intervention, a researcher serves as a non-participant observer of some aspect of clinical practice. And the researcher uses the tools of ethnography, including observing moments of clinical practice, doing interviews and taking field notes. And all of this ethnographic work is done with a particular intention to allow practitioners to see their practices from a new vantage point. And in seeing these practices from a new vantage point, practitioners may be better equipped to make sense of the complexities of their day-to-day -day work. And through this understanding, they can collectively imagine ways to intervene in practices that are troublesome, but also be able to see what elements of clinical practice are useful and important to maintain. So this intervention of video reflexive ethnography, it evolves through phases. And to start, the researcher gets to understand the clinical practice site, and this involves observations and interviews. Then in collaboration with the practitioners, the intervention team chooses an element of clinical practice that's particularly important for the practitioners to more fully explore. So this could be an element of practice that's troubling or difficult, such as problems with organizing patient care and flow. This could be an element of practice that happens all the time, but it's perhaps not happening optimally. An example could be clinical handovers as clinicians transfer information to one another. Or these could be elements of practice that are particularly high stakes, such as maintaining infection control measures during high-risk procedures. The point here is the collaboration, that the researcher and the practitioners choose these moments of deeper exploration together. Following that collaborative work, the researcher videos examples of real life practice. They might video steps related to organizing patient care. They might video examples of real-time clinical handovers. They might video minute details of real-time infection control procedures. I recall hearing a presentation on one study that spent the entire time videoing clinicians' hands as they entered a patient's room, prepared for, and eventually completed an intubation. So the video becomes a tool, and as with other tools, the value becomes apparent in how it's used. In this methodology, the researcher brings the final sets of videos back to the clinical team, and together they examine the video, and they make sense of what they see happening in everyday practice and what's not available to be seen. Dr. Jess Jessica Mesman is one of the leading video reflexive ethnography methodologists, and I was at a conference once where she shared examples from a study of infection control procedures in an intensive care unit. And an example of infection control, control procedures as part of the patient intubation, the viewers noted that the place where the gloves are stored was not on the video. And so the act of watching this video brought into view how infection control procedures started well before the clinician entered the room, involving the work of those stocking and maintaining supply areas. Watching that video also show, showed a shared habit of touching the guardrails on the bed, unconsciously but consistently by many practitioners, often as they were leaning in to talk to the patient or offer comfort. And it was a very human response that was so human and so natural that it had gone unnoticed. And seeing it on the video gave the team the perspective to see what had previously been invisible and therefore gave them the tools to start reconfiguring their habits. And that's what's core to this methodology, these meetings. Labeled as reflexive meetings, these meetings are facilitated opportunities to discuss the video, 
engaging in dialogue about what is revealed, what's obscured, and what else needs to be understood. And the intention is to develop capacity for, re for reflection and action. So here the practitioners develop and internalize a disposition towards reflection that they may then use to understand and innovate the practices in real time. And this has the potential to go beyond simple problem solving. While we all engage in problem solving at work, not all problem solving is actually learning. At its most fundamental, problem solving is just about getting the job done. Problem solving might lead to new efficiencies, and sometimes that's all we need. But problem solving might also lead to workarounds that are not appropriate or cause other harms. Glenn Regeer and Maria Malopoulos write about this in the Journal of Continuing Education and Health Professions in, in 2008. So real learning is not just problem solving. Real learning involves a radical shift in understanding some aspect of practice. And this new understanding would reconfigure understandings of past practices, offering a new way to understand a new old problem. This new understanding may serve to address the problem at hand, but the new understanding would also shape future conceptualizations of practice, affording new resources for making sense of not yet experienced dilemmas. And it's this new capacity for intelligent action that distinguishes mere problem solving from active learning. And this is the real learning we need to understand if we want to promote it. So in this example of video reflexive ethnography, published resources tend to talk about the role of the researcher working in collaboration with the clinical team. But everything that's said about the role of the researcher aligns with how we might conceive of the role of an educator, taking a sociocultural perspective on learning and working to support capacity for professional learning within clinical workplaces. It's through the videos that participants have the opportunity to zoom in to the minutia of their work. The facilitated discussions also allow participants to zoom out and explore how their professions, their regulatory bodies, and their employers shape their work. And all of this exploratory work is oriented towards increasing the capacity for intelligent action in ways that are sensitive to specific contexts. And the increased capacity for intelligent action is core to the concept of professional learning. So in this example, the educator acts as a convener, a facilitator, as someone who holds reflective space for the professionals. And in doing so, the professionals are able to work through conflicting forms of knowledge and how to translate these knowledge claims into their physical day-to-day -day realities of their work. So this is a way, a way to think about the role of an educator in supporting professional learning. What professionals learn in their day-to-day -day practice is everyday practice. They do not automatically learn to analyze those practices, to develop alternatives, or how to reconcile the limits of the status quo. Nor do they necessarily learn how to respond strategically to the pressures acting on them from their organizations that they might find uncomfortable. So there's a place here for educators to set up programs and processes which enable clinicians to engage thoughtfully with their practices throughout their career. And this would be a powerful contribution to continuing professional development. A core mechanism of video reflexive ethnography is a strategy of using videos to help practitioners see their work from a vantage point other than their own. So to experience their practice from the perspective of an interested observer. And it's from this position that practitioners might be able to appreciate their own practice differently opening up and creating possibilities for intervention. So this notion of vantage point brings to mind another study I had done with my colleague Ayala Cooper, and we'd wanted to understand this phenomenon of healthcare providers who have the experience of being a patient or a caregiver, and as a result, describe themselves as becoming more compassionate professionals. So in interviewing these healthcare providers, we certainly heard these narratives of compassion, but what we also heard was this notion of reflexivity and the sometimes heart-rendering realization that participants have been part of a healthcare system practices and processes that contribute to systemized experiences of patient vulnerability. And this seemed to be a core process of developing compassion as a result of having their own patient experience. It was this opportunity to see their practices, their professions, their organizations from the standpoint of a patient. And while this theme persisted across multiple interviews, I want to focus here on one particular interview in order to draw out some of the emotional content embedded in this realization. So this interview was from a participant who was a young, otherwise healthy woman, and she had experienced a rare infection that had resulted in hospitalization, and she was isolated in a general medical unit. Now, her own clinical practice had been within general medical unit at another hospital. So the routines, the practices, and the rhythms of the unit were very familiar to her. And in recounting one particular day during her patient's stay, she focused on the food tray that had been delivered outside of her door. Now, she'd already decided that hospital food was unpalatable, so she had her own food with her in the room. But after a few hours, she realized that her breakfast tray was still outside the door. No one had delivered it. And no one had checked to see if she was hungry. And as the day went on, she continued to notice that tray. It was still waiting. And as the afternoon turned to evening, the tray began to represent the loneliness, the isolation. 
the feeling of stigma that had pervaded her experience as an inpatient. And a particularly moving moment in the interview was when she said, and I thought about how many times I would just walk by patients who were in isolation. And I'd see their trays and I would say, it's a nurse's job to bring that tray in. And I said to my husband, I said, and here she became tearful, if I ever go back to medicine and work, I won't walk past those trays. So upon reflection, she articulated that what had overcome her in the interview was not recounting her experience of being a patient. She'd already worked through that. But it was her recognition of her unknowing participation in creating a particular kind of patienthood as part of her routine professional work. Here, patienthood meant to feel vulnerable, lonely, and afraid. And for this participant, and as for others that echoed similar reflections, having a patient experience was not just about increasing compassion as a healthcare provider, but it was about brushing up against one's own participation in the systems that they experienced as diminishing while in their patient role. So for this participant, it was taking a standpoint of vulnerability that revealed dynamics that she had not fully appreciated when she was solely in the role of provider. And as a result, she had a radical shift in her understanding of practice and a shift that changed how she interpreted past practice experiences and how she understood future practice dilemmas. And that notion of standpoint is one that I've carried through other pieces of research I've done on the topic of patient engagement in healthcare. Now, there's lots of rationales to explore related to patient engagement. And the thread that I'm following in my research is particularly related to notions of learning with and from patients in order to inform professional practice. Now, there's some really interesting and critical work going on in this domain of patient engagement. And there's interventions that intentionally create new kinds of knowledge spaces that attempt to bridge the life world of patients and the socio-technical world of professionals. And this patient engagement work brings forward many questions about knowledge and expertise, but also about power and voice. And while this patient engagement work may not always fall into the domain of traditional continuing education, it certainly animates questions about professional knowledge, identity, and accountability. So all of these questions sit within the domain of a sociological understanding of professions and sociocultural interpretations of learning. So if we open up our imagination to include rich sites of professional learning, I think we'll discover many new partners and opportunities to contribute. So the strategy I'm advocating here is for educators to look at the world of patient engagement, to consider the opportunities for, for professional learning here, and to consider how educators and education scientists might contribute to efforts to learn with and from patients. Looking at professional learning in this broader sense, we begin to see a whole host of other workplace contexts that have not typically been defined as within the scope of formal continuing education. Patient safety is another interesting place to look for dilemmas and opportunities related to professional learning, not in the least because it's so important. The notion of working to reduce avoidable harm for patients is inherently good. There's no arguing with this moral imperative. As such, there's a lot of groups interested and invested in this work, starting primarily and obviously with patients themselves, but also all the health professionals, policymakers, healthcare organizations and administrators, regulatory bodies, professional associations. Further, there are many groups producing knowledge relevant to the safety domain from a wide range of disciplines. There's science from human factors, epidemiology, cognitive and behavioral psychology, but also economics, policy science, and sociology, all intermingled with practice-based knowledge of professionals and patients about the work that's involved in creating and maintaining safe care. A primary ambition of the patient safety movement is to create resilient healthcare systems that are as fail safe as possible. And the current patient safety movement proposes to meet that aim by building learning cultures where health professionals will disclose, report, and respond to incidents, and where professionals learn to think and enact system optimizations, and where professionals willingly adopt new safety practices. So the realm of patient safety brings all of the sociological understandings of professions and sociocultural elements of professional learning into high visibility. There's a huge amount of information, lots of knowledge claims, competing disciplines, a host of invested stakeholders, conditions of risk, and associated implications for professional identity and accountability. And yet, the domain of education is often dismissed from patient safety efforts. Characterized as a weak intervention by safety sciences, education is assumed to work solely at the level of addressing knowledge gaps in individual clinicians. Safety scientists argue that individual knowledge gaps are rarely the root cause of patient safety lapses. So if continuing education is taken to mean the filling of specific knowledge gaps in individuals, it will always play a marginal role in larger patient safety efforts. At best, continuing education will be seen as a mechanism for disseminating guidelines. At worst, continuing education will be seen as a disappointing waste of limited resources. 
We need to rescue the field of continuing education from this narrow conceptualization. And we do this by enlarging the focus beyond continuing education interventions to consider how professionals learn and perpetuate safety practices. And by recognizing the essential role that professional learning plays in any reform, renewal, transition, or transformation of clinical practice. Dr. Christine Peterson is a social scientist from the Netherlands who writes about organizing patient safety, and she uses sociocultural and sociological theories to understand professional practice and to draw connections to professional learning. And in her book, she argues that the real progress in the domain of patient safety will require patient safety specialists, educators, and professionals to develop a new conceptualization of knowledge that can capture the delicate structures of collaboration, experience-based habits, acquired skills, practice routines, practical ways of reasoning, and the safety, disp safety dispositions of healthcare professionals that create safe care. So this kind of focus could be accomplished through strategies such as video reflexive ethnography. This could also be accomplished by exploring patient safety interventions that rely on mechanisms of professional learning, but are not usually identified as educational interventions. Academics that study workplace learning have a particular name for these kinds of interventions. Integrated developmental practices are those that are embedded in workplaces and workplace practices, and they're intended to facilitate learning, but they're independent of formal training programs, and they're not defined explicitly in terms of training and education. These practices are usually managed or implemented by people whose primary job function is not training or learning. And there are entire constellations of safety practices that would fall into this category. Incident reporting and investigation, morbidity and mortality rounds, safety coaches, knowledge management systems. I say there's a clear role here for supporting professional learning through these integrated practices. And there's an opportunity for educators to be more involved in these spaces, to partner with practitioners and patient safety specialists to co-produce a realistic and non-idealized way of understanding how professionals actually learn through all of this patient safety work. And through this grounded understanding of how professionals actually learn through the work, we might be better situated to support that learning. Throughout this discussion of strategies, I've emphasized the potential for expanded communities with a shared aim of supporting professional learning. And a common thread is this notion of crossing boundaries and building connections with other domains that are interested in shaping professional practice. But to treat these communities as unified would work against my own assumptions about landscapes of professional knowledge. Circling back to the history of CPR, that story introduced a growing ensemble of interested stakeholders. And that history was rife with conflicts and conquests. To ignore those dynamics of power through an optimistic focus on strategies would be to squander much of the creative potential of sociocultural perspectives of learning. We'd miss too much of the story if we didn't consider power. So in the context of professional learning in practice and through practice, there's a risk that we might also miss too much of the story by simply equating professional learning needs with the learning needs of the organization where the professionals work, or by assuming that all professional learning will naturally be aligned with the imperatives of employers. And while there may very well be alignments, that's something to be explored empirically, critically, rather than assumed normatively. So in the absence of this kind of exploration, there's a risk that concepts of lifelong learning may tilt towards organizational concerns and organizational logics of efficiency and performance. And this kind of shift towards efficiency may have unintended consequences for the long-term development of professionals and professions and the various institutions, clients, and members of society that are reliant on professional knowledge development. Almost 20 years ago, educational researcher Dr. Tara Fenwick ended her overview chapter on workplace learning with the following provocation. Most importantly, we need to be clear about our purposes and allegiances when we take up these questions of workplace learning. Why do we ask them? What is it that we wish to bring about? Whose interests are we committed to supporting the most? And perhaps fundamentally for us as educators, are we ultimately for workers' well-being or for the corporation's productivity? Critical perspectives do not allow us to take a simple, unreflective, and both response to that final provocation. That provocation requires a thoughtful response. It demands it even. To not engage with that question risks being unreflexively enrolled in the dominant discourses. And as educators, we're required to remain critically reflective on our own practices, what they create, for who, and to what effect. And while we may ultimately aspire to enhance learning in ways that support professionals, the organizations they work for, and the patients that rely on them, we have a responsibility to remain vigilant about the potential unintended consequences of our own educational work. 
To that end, we need to develop critical methods for observing and analyzing professional learning, guided by assumptions that this learning is embedded within the context where professionals work. And this requires blending theoretical perspectives from the sociology of work, feminist perspectives, labor analyses, critical social theories, as well as organizational theories and philosophies of knowledge. We're in a moment in time when there is so much information available from so many sources. And now more than ever, we can see the dilemmas of professional learning operating at high relief, high stakes and high visibility. How to sort through information, how to discern between what's valuable, what's noise, how to reconcile conflicting advice, how to translate emerging research into practice decisions, how to manage disconnects between what's emerging in the research settings with what's being experienced in practice, how to share knowledge across communities, learning what needs to be standardized and what needs to be innovated, how to relate to other forms of expertise, and how to balance the obligation to share knowledge with the other enormous demands of professional work. These dynamics of professional learning have always been there. And the ability to navigate this complex work is part of my admiration for professionals and the work they do throughout their careers. I think this complexity is becoming progressively intensified. And there's just so much more to know. Further, there's more and more stakeholders attempting to influence what and how professionals should know. And as knowledge spaces become ever more crowded with knowledge producing bodies, there are bound to be more disputes about what constitutes legitimate knowledge. So as educators, how do we help professionals navigate, negotiate, amplify, transform, or even resist these various learning imperatives? Sociocultural understandings of learning give us access to these kinds of questions. And a focus on professional learning helps to open up our imagination, thinking beyond traditional educational interventions, as we envision our roles as educators and education scientists in the realm of continuing professional development. Not all professional practices have a history as long or as lyrical as the history of CPR, but presumably most practices in healthcare share the same origin of intending to improve the lives of patients. Now, if we as educators seek to contribute to the development of professional practice, to understand how practices change, but also how they're made stable and enduring, then a key issue is to think about these relationships between practice and learning. And this requires a nuanced understanding of the complexities of professional work. This also requires understanding how professional knowledge is shaped through interconnected systems of professional production. And it's through this understanding that we can negotiate connections between professional practice, learning, and change. In that process, I hope we contribute to sustaining useful practices and innovating even better ones. Practices that are better for patients and better for professionals. And it's this larger ambition that I'm pointing towards when I say professional learning. Hey, thank you so much, Paula. I'm just going to jump in now. Uh, welcome back, the live Paula. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you would have coordinated your outfit, actually, so that it seems oh. <laughs> missed opportunity. <laughs> close, close, close color tone. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, I shared one comment that you really made me think about what being professional in, in the healthcare system means. Um, you know, perhaps I was operating under kind of an old fashioned view that being professional meant following what was prescribed by the profession, perhaps that, you know, mm -hmm. some group decided what it meant to be professional within medicine, let's say, which could then influence what the scope of practice might be, which could then influence what the curriculum might be. And through that, you know, you create a design of what the student learns because it's all sort of created for them decided for them in advance but for me you were challenging me to think about that as well as an individual perhaps mm -hmm. being professional means choosing to learn and continue to to change your own practice um i don't know if you have anything in, in terms of a reaction to that or, or a comment for that um i thought i would just sort of warm up the audience with a with mm -hmm. a question to you directly um and your video was very engaging i did let everyone know that that video would be shared for mm -hmm. uh for them to view again later um online but um now is a chance to engage the speaker in some conversation um yeah so this thought about the definition of of professional is that something you're hoping to change kind of the old-fashioned version and where we would go forward Thank you. And it's a, it's a great question. It's a very thought provoking question. And I wouldn't say that there's an era that there's an old fashioned view and a new fashion view. I think that these two different understandings of professions have been developing at the same time. Mm 
and that they're um, hanging out in different bodies of literature. So there's certainly a body of literature that talks about professions and talks about the traits of professions and the professions themselves tend to define those traits and then try to perpetuate them. Um, and that can be called a trait perspective, a functionalist perspective, or an essentialist perspective. And that's got a very long history. The history I'm drawing from is just as long, um, a more of a sociological look at professions, and it argues to take the zoom out and to look at the role of professions in society. And part of the argument there is, is that if a profession continues to define itself and continues to attempt to perpetuate itself, its, its focus continues to be quite insular on its own profession. And all the things that are changing about what patients and publics are expecting about profession, what the kind of negotiations that are happening between employers, professions, and regulatory bodies, all of these other things that are shaping the possibilities for the professions um, can slip out of view when we keep focusing on an internal focus on the profession, what kind of skills and traits are we trying to perpetuate? So it's not that one's replacing the other, they're, they're different bodies of literature and different perspectives. And then they orient a little bit differently to this idea of, um, do we learn because we're professionals and that's our, our obligation to learn? Mm. Do we learn because we have a particular role in society and patients and public expect us to learn? So certainly you see in the patient safety movements, one of the most egregious things is to not learn from a mistake. So there's, there's a sense of accountability there about learning that's beyond just updating knowledge or staying current, that's inclusive of learning from practice and within practice. And all of those things come into view when I take a sociocultural and sociological perspective on professions. Thank you, yes. Um, that's a very good answer. Led to certainly some more challenging thinking because um, I think I'd be in line with the reviewer um, that was helping you with your manuscript and saying, well, everything's <laughs> learning, right? Yeah. It's sort of every day we learn, we just can't help but learn. Um, but you're sort of talking about some more nuanced, intentional, meaningful learning. Um, so we have some questions in the chat. Um, and so the first one, I'm just trying to think if you had responded to any of these. So I'll go with the question that Sarah uh, has reposed. Uh, what do you think of the influence of SCLT on students' assessments? Uh, do you need to look at other outcomes and measures rather than the traditional ones? I don't know if that needs further exploration. Uh, explanation. I'm sorry. It will. It will for me. Yes. Okay. Sarah, I don't know if you want to jump in. I think I would need an explanation of what SCLT means. Thank you for saying that, Sandra. I do. <laughs> I can guess sociocultural. Oh, sociocultural learning theory on students' assessment. Is that what ah, that is? Okay. Ah, okay. yes. Thank you. I don't always use that acronym. I hope that's right, Sarah. Say something in the chat box if I've read that differently. Um, so assessment. I find assessment a really interesting and really complex space, and it's a space that I learn from others. So it's not a space that I bring my research into. This is a place where I look for collaborators that are thinking about this deeply. And I know that a group in Australia just started writing about um, what the sociocultural learning theory perspectives might imply for assessment. And they were writing from the perspective of thinking about pre-licensure. And then where we see it in practice-based learning or in workplace learning is thinking about concepts of performance and thinking beyond individuals and thinking about how people perform together within the context mm -hmm. of their work. So then it kind of pulls in different ideas and then different ideas about accountability. But I think that the the language in the world of assessment, the way I think about it and from a sociocultural perspective is um, I keep pulling it in when I start talking about accountabilities. And so assessment as one mechanism possibly to display or to honor accountabilities and paying attention to that about what's changing in terms of what accountabilities professions are holding, how and how do we make them visible. Um, but I'll try to find that reference yeah. um, coming from Australia. It was coming from uh, Cradle. Okay. Um, yeah, just thinking about your answer and trying to, I mean, there's some spaces maybe, uh, and I guess the, the word high stakes or standardized assessments are, are places where um, taking a social cultural perspective 
may be difficult, I suppose, in terms of um, assessing accountabilities or how um, you would look at different factors that influence what the student themselves has managed to do within a context. Um, but a lot more freedom, perhaps room for, for incorporating these theories in, in the workplace and in, in education. Um, and I will say a lot of the history that I'm pulling from is not necessarily coming from the education field. It's coming from workplaces, sociology of work, sociology of professions at work and through okay. work. Mm -hmm. And the um, concepts of workplace learning, practice-based learning in the context of the work that we're doing. So from the time we graduate, for the duration of our career, what are we learning and accountable towards? And I think that's part right. of why the assessment conversation shows up somewhat differently. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's part of why I need to collaborate and learn from my colleagues who are talking and thinking about assessment more at the pre-registration level. Yeah, um, certainly some clarification in terms of where things might divide or, or where they do align. Um, okay, so I'm going to read this next question from Nambila. If you had to choose a word to use instead of professional, what would it be? Um, oh. So example to replace a professional and professional identity. Perhaps we could split it into organizational and patient facing. Interesting. So there's some interesting identity work there. Um, and where I'm pulling the word professional and where I'm being so intentional about it, again, is coming from this long history of studies of professions and the role they have in society. So I'm not just concerned with regulated health professionals. I'm interested who becomes regulated and why but I don't use that to distinguish between who's professional and who's not. I actually don't spend a lot of time distinguishing between who holds the title of professional and who doesn't. The literature did that for a long time. What's a true profession mm -hmm. and what's an occupation? And I'm not that interested in that conversation. I'm more interested in the kinds of roles that the professions play in society. And I'm really anchoring on that idea of risk. So a group, an occupational group that is using their knowledge to provide a service to the public and to society that's got some level of risk to it. Okay. It's how I use that concept. And then that gives me some focus about how I'm thinking about learning for this particular group. Because there's certainly other groups that have a high level of expertise, um, a high level of skill, a high level of knowledge that don't show up in some of my thinking about professions because they don't hold that same aspect of risk. And so that's more of a decision for how I uh, focus my research. But the question that came up about the organization facing and the patient facing, that's interesting because in the same body of literature that I'm following that's talking about the sociological perspective on professions, they're, they're building ideas and these are ideas I want to keep extending about professional identity that's tied to our professions and professional identity that's tied to our employers or the places where we work. Mm. So occupational professional identity and the kind of um, identity work we do to our home professions, but then the context of the places where we work for you know, 20, 30 years, and mm. is there things that are tied to organizational identity and when do those things potentially end up in tension and how, to, how do we reconcile that throughout our careers? Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from any of the clinicians currently in the audience about their experiences navigating some of those tensions. But just where um, you were going with that, Paula, right now, took me back to a thought I had earlier during the video about um, the way you were sort of defining professional learning and considering um, the social cultural influences on uh, being professional and, and how learning um, is undertaken. I started to think that, okay, professional learning now seems to also incorporate the patient in terms of the patients could be learning. Um, and so sort of the question that arose at that time, um, especially when you moved into describing the uses of the use of video uh, for the non-participatory uh, research um, methodology was, could videos be used as potential tools, not only to help clinicians understand their work and learn from what they've done, would you see a place for using that to help patients understand um, some of their own encounters with clinicians, should that be um, one of the things that we should seek in terms of who's learning uh, professionally, uh, given that patients are influencing the profession of, of healthcare as well? 
Yeah, I certainly include patients and publics within my understanding of how professions learn what they're accountable for, the identity work that's tied to professions, and the kinds of relationships professions have to patients and publics. And then I think the methodology of video is so interesting because of the way that allows an alternate standpoint. It allows you to look at practice or to look at a scenario from a standpoint other than your own. And then that becomes a, an opportunity for discussion where you almost put this practice in the middle of the table and we all look at it together. Um, from our different perspectives and thereby understand it differently. And so there's that really interesting work around the video reflexive ethnography. There's also a lot of work around photo voice, um, the kinds of pictures patients take of some of their experiences and how that shows how they make sense of their patient experience. Um, I'd love to do a study one day of uh, somebody coming in for a high risk procedure and for them to take pictures of what they look at to make a decision about whether they feel safe or not. I'm so curious to see where, where do they find their cues about whether they feel safe or not. Now, ethically that's charged. I can't find a way yet to give someone a camera and bring it into their patient care areas. But I think it would be so interesting because I wonder how often it's somebody's face. I wonder how often it's all those different stickers um, that say, don't turn this off, don't turn that off, turn this one on, and they're all in the same place yeah. in space. Um, yeah, what, what are people paying attention to when they're making decisions about whether they feel safe in our care? Or just even making decisions to, I guess when you were talking about it, I went to the scenario of, um, you know, getting consent to proceed with a, with a surgery um, mm -hmm. or having a patient decide to proceed with a risky uh, procedure or, or not, uh, and the idea of shared uh, decision making, right? So mm -hmm. um, I thought there is quite a bit of work that goes into understanding risk and how patients evaluate risk. Um, and, and this would be a really useful tool to kind of add to that, that field. Um, yeah, so uh, Nabila asks, would they always realize their cues? Um, not sure if that means like for the patient or for the clinician, but yeah, they, the person being recorded may not themselves realize what they're responding to. Um, okay, just waiting to see if anyone's raised their hand. I'm not sure if I'm missing anyone or not. But we are coming close to the end of the hour. Um, let me see if I'd noted anything. There was one thought I had, and maybe if no one else has anything left to, to post in the chat, I'll just share one thought I had with you, Paula, before we uh, wrap up. Um, when you started out talking about the history of CPR, I thought it was a really yeah. powerful storytelling and a great example. Um, you know, I thought the Society for the Dead was sort of like probably the first <laughs> example of patient advocacy, except they were advocating for uh, for the dead. So sort of very ironic. Um, there was a power that came in that I thought was present from telling the retrospective of that mm. and how how professional learning occurred around the CPR um, context. And I wondered, um, I mean, so, you know, just my bias, I'm an experimental scientist, quantitative, um, mostly positivist, I guess. So if, forgive me if this question seems silly, but I wondered if the, you, there's a different sense of power in terms of understanding the, those same dynamics in the moment compared to sort of looking back, because when you look back, you have access to, uh, or potentially over time, you can uncover all of the, the little turns and, and things that linked together and influential factors, whether they're political or um, environmental or, or what have you. In the moment, you may not understand all of those, those nuances. So um, I don't know what's been your experience, if you have a sense, a qualitative sense that that's different. Well, I certainly agree, and I think that we're probably even more aligned. It's that certainly you make meaning in understanding something in retrospect. Um, and so what I was recounting, that was a 200-year history that I synthesized into five minutes or so, and it really was pulled from those two books, although I take credit for finding that image of the Society of the Apparently Dead. I was so happy I found that. Um, so what I was trying to do with the story was not make any claims about whether the participants thought they were learning or not or how they were learning. It was more what I was choosing to pull forward in the story 
to try to display, I am taking a sociocultural interpretation of this history. And I recognize someone coming from a different paradigm of learning would uh, take a different interpretation of that history. Mm -hmm. So I was intentionally pulling forward politics, scope of practice, um, contests around knowledge, uh, ideas about power, don't the kind of discourses that end up becoming dominant and the ones that get dropped. Practices that manage to perpetuate um, with no other evidence and really questionable reasoning. I, I actually said rectal fumigation, like as a practice that I've heard about 200 years later, it must have persisted long enough that it made it into the history books. So um, that's what I was trying to do with the story is more to display my interpretation of it as an example, as a sociocultural interpretation of a particular history. I, I feel like there's at least one member in our audience that's gonna make that a challenge for themselves to include that term in a coming talk. <laughs> but uh, it's definitely the first presentation or ra formal rounds I've ever been to where that term was included. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so great job in, uh, interpreting the, the past in that way. Um, there are two more questions, if you're okay to stick with us for a couple more minutes. Um, sure. So Jonathan asks whether you distinguish between an intimate group, people you know, opinion leaders, or the demographic group uh, within your specialty as having different types of social influence. And he cites Vygotsky and Bandura. Yes, yes. So I think that then becomes a unit of analysis kind of conversation about what part of the phenomenon are you trying to understand and what level are you looking at trying to understand it. So um, in terms of looking at immediate decision making and the uh, immediate context of opinion leaders and the dynamics that are there, that's, that's one layer of the onion to be able to look at and then being able to connect that to um, dynamics that are happening in a larger society, then that's a different layer of the onion. Mm -hmm. And I think that the different theorists um, that Jonathan has put there give you access to different parts of that phenomenon and depending on what you're trying to understand and why. But yeah, certainly Vygotsky, he's foundational to a lot of this thinking. Uh, Engstrom is also foundational in that idea of expansive learning, um, as is uh, Chatsky and some of the practice theorists. So that's, that's the camp that um, that I'm in while I'm trying to invoke these ideas. Um, actually, that makes me wonder if would it be possible to have you share a list of some of some readings or other references? Uh, it could be by email and then we could add it perhaps to the video um, or, or somewhere uh, it, with our community. We could share uh, resources that they could um, use to catch up on on some of the theories that you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, I can see make some... my whole reference <laughs> yeah. list as a PDF that when you post the video, you yes. have that whole reference list. And I'm adding yeah. some more based on what the questions I'm seeing come up. Yes, we can link to some notes uh, within the YouTube channel because uh, whatever's in the chat here will certainly go away uh, once we're done. Um, yeah, so thank you. I don't see any hands up or any. Um, there's not, there's a comment from Bronte about the power dynamic uh, and the physician patient relationship cueing uh, the feelings of being safe. Um, mm. Certainly, yeah, that, uh, those are some things that could be explored using the video methodology. Mm -hmm. One more chat. Uh, oh, just a reminder to our audience um, that we have the Norman Education Research Day coming up on June 3rd. And everyone can find links to that at merit.mcmaster.ca. Uh, oh, I see we have someone coming in from Vancouver joining us today. That's the first one for Merit Rounds. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of firsts today. Um, <laughs> Paula's presenting from her house and yeah. she had a pre-recorded video. Yeah. Um, thank you to everyone for, for joining us. Thank you, Paula, for sharing your work, your time, uh, and doing so much work to prep uh, so that this mm -hmm. could be uh, a rather efficient, uh, fluid presentation. Uh, and thank you for creating that video, which will be in our archive. Thank you very much um, for inviting me. As well. Okay. Uh, Great. And that's officially the end of the rounds today. Thank you. Thank you.